Hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to the fifth and final webinar in the Hidden Life of the Forest Preserves webinar series with the Friends of the Forest Preserves. We're going to get started in just about five minutes to give everyone a chance to connect with Zoom and get acquainted with their systems. Uh, while you're waiting, feel free to say hello in the chat feature. If you look at the bottom of the screen and you click on that chat button, uh, we'd love for you to go ahead and type in uh, hello and tell us where you're tuning in from tonight. And then after you do that, you'll let you take a quick moment to fill out this poll that I'm going to launch. So as folks are trickling in, uh, feel free to use that chat box to introduce yourself and then go ahead and fill out the poll as it should pop up on your screen. Thanks everyone for joining. As you're trickling in, use that chat function at the bottom of your screen just to say hello and tell us where you're tuning in from. And then you should see a poll launched on your Zoom screen as well. And go ahead and fill that out as well, please. Thanks for everyone who's saying hello in the chat box. We're seeing some familiar faces and some new ones, so. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Hello and welcome for everybody who's just joining. Uh, we're going to wait a few minutes to let everyone get acquainted with Zoom. So in the meantime, we're saying hello and telling everyone where we're tuning in from in the chat box. And then you should see the poll launched on your screen. So please fill that out as well. We've got just about 80% of people so far filling out the poll. So thank you everybody for doing that. We'll share the results in just another minute or two. And for uh, anyone who's asking in the chat box, the poll should automatically pop up on your screen um, as a separate, a separate box. Hello, everyone. Great to see these responses in the chat box. Looks like we've got people tuning in from all over the county. Welcome, everyone. We'll just give another 30 seconds or so for the chat for those of you that have it on your screen. Um, and as folks continue to trickle in, we'll get it started in just another minute or so. All right, great to see some familiar faces in the chat. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll and share the results with everyone. So it looks like we have a good mix in the crowd. Quite a few folks are familiar with the Forest Preserves but wanna learn a little bit more. We've got lots of friends of the Forest Preserve members and then a good mix between folks that have been to Palos and those who haven't. So thanks everybody so much um, for joining tonight and also for your responses in the poll. And welcome again to the Hidden Life of the Forest Preserves. Um, this is, uh, my, my name is Peter. I'm the Spring Creek field organizer here with the Friends of the Forest Preserve. And I'm really looking forward to tonight's presentation on the Palos Preserves and, and I'm really glad you joined us. So thank you again. I hope you walk away with some new information about both the nature and, and the people that make Palos so special. And, and ultimately I hope you get inspired to get outdoors and visit some of the sites yourself. Friends of the Forest Preserve 
uh, serves to unite people to protect, promote, and care for the forest preserves in Cook County. We're a nonprofit, independent nonprofit organization that's solely focused on the forest preserves in Cook County. So we work to safeguard and improve the 70,000 of acres of forest preserve for all of us here today in the county and, and for generations to come. So we're really glad that you're here tuning in virtually. And of course, we'd prefer to see you out in the preserves or on the trails. We're really happy to connect with you any way you can. We're so thankful that everyone's joining in for the webinar series. So tonight's program is the fifth and final part in this series. Um, Friends staff has been hosting this Hidden Life of the Forest Preserve series, highlighting different regions of the forest preserves across the county. Um, and if this is, if you're joining us for the first time tonight, you can check out our previous webinars on the Friends of the Forest Preserve YouTube channel. So before I turn it over to Zach Taylor, the Friends Conservation Director and our presentation, our presenter for tonight, um, I'd just like to go over a few housekeeping items. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce you to Gloria Orozco, who's the Calumet field, field Organizer, and she'll be our tech assistant tonight. So if you have any issues connecting with Zoom or any connection or any issues with audio or your visual, um, you can go ahead and use that chat box to directly measure uh, or directly message Gloria and she'll be able to help you out with any issues you might be having. Um, second, we're going to mute everyone during the presentation but we really are hoping to get lots of great questions from the audience. So we're gonna use this Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Uh, for those of you who have joined previous webinars, this is gonna look a little bit different, but you'll select that Q&A feature on the bottom of your screen and then you'll be able to submit your questions. Feel free to submit them at any time during the presentation and then we'll save some time at the end to go over questions and, and have Zach answer all those. If we don't get to any of them, then we'll be sure to answer them over email as well. Um, Lastly, without any further ado, please be aware that the webinar is being recorded, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Zach and thank everybody again for joining. All right, thank you, Peter. Hi, everyone, great to see you tonight. Um, I'm gonna just pop my uh, presentation open here. All right. Well, thanks again for joining. Um, as Peter mentioned, this is the Hidden Life of the Forest Preserves webinar series. This is the Palos edition. Um, thanks to Gloria and Peter for being my co-host tonight. Um, what I wanted to say, first of all, is uh, there's some acknowledgement that I have to do in terms of uh, who helped me create this presentation. So shout out to some of the Forest Preserve District of Cook County staffers that helped me put these slides together. Uh, Chip O'Leary, Troy Showerman, and Alice Brandon all contributed. Also uh, from Friends of the Forest Preserve, uh, Sochi Lopez, uh, Stephen Vanderbrook, um, Pat Williams, and the Palos Conservation Corps helped me put together a video that you will see at the end of this. Um, and then the Palos Restoration Project also um, are, are, are the stars of the video and helped contribute to this presentation. So um, those people are Joe Newman, uh, Diana Crude, and Jan Petrzak. So. Thank you all for helping us uh, get this uh, presentation together. And without further ado, let's jump right in. Um, all right, so I gotta tell you a little bit about myself. Um, that's me on the right. I think it's one of many trips to Arizona. I, I think I'm in the desert outside of Tucson, Arizona um, in that picture. Um, we, we took a lot of trips to Arizona because that's where my grandparents lived, um, but we always got to have um, a trip to the desert to do some hiking. And that was um, a really a, a big highlight of my youth. And uh, it was really formative um, in terms of me connecting with nature. And right about this, uh, the, that same time, um, I'm, I'm from this area um, near Westchester, Illinois. And um, an elementary school teacher took us on a field trip to Wolf Road Prairie. And um, we were all hiking in Wolf Road Prairie, and one of the chaperones um, kind of pulled me aside and said, here, uh, take a bite of this plant. Um, and I, of course, I just said, sure, okay. And um, I took it. It was very bitter. And it tasted like an onion. I said, is that an onion? Um, and he said, that's nodding wild onion. Um, and that experience is so tactile, so sensory, um, that um, it, it, it helped me remember what that plant was, um, but also remember uh, how special that, that trip to the preserves was. Um, fast forward uh, about 30 years, 
And you can see that's my family on the left. My son is playing um, a, a game, I think he called Fall Off the Bike. And um, that's my wife and my other son up in the distance and they're having none of it. They're ready to get going. Um, but this is an image from um, our COVID-19 pandemic experience. Um, and we tried to get out to a, a forest preserve each week and go put someplace new. And I know for a lot of people, during COVID-19, um, the forest preserves has tr have truly been um, a sanctuary. So um, just like for you guys, um, we really appreciated uh, um, the space. Um, it, it allowed us to get to physical, physical activity, to work on our emotional health, uh, to explore some place um, in the public arena that was also safe where we could social distance. Um, and it helped me reframe my relationship with the forest preserves and think more about how important these places are um, for people um, and nature. And I hope after this presentation, um, you will then introduce some of the places that we're gonna talk about tonight to a young person because positive relationships with nature at an early age have been shown um, to make environmentalists in the future. So um, I hope that is one takeaway. Um, part of the reason I love my job so much is that I get to connect a lot of people to nature. Um, I am able to work on two high school programs. One is called the Chicago Conservation Leadership Corps, and we, we run that in partnership with the SEA and the Forest Preserves. That gets about 80 um, high school youth out into the preserves each um, summer. And then we also work on something called the Forest Preserve Experience Program with the Housing Authority of Cook County, and that gets another 100 kids working um, on, ha on hands-on conservation projects in the forest preserve. So um, that's just, it's a highlight of my summer each year and I'm able to connect to a, a lot of people to these important places. And I hope, I hope you help me spread the word about how important they are. Um, lastly, you know, I, I just wanna say this is not um, for kids and teens only. We also have um, an adult conservation court program that I focus a lot of my work on um, this Adult Conservation Corps works year-round in the forest preserves. We have 25 um, members who are working full-time, um, working uh, four days a week, 36 hours a week on invasive plant removal in the forest preserves. So a lot of dedicated people to taking care of these places. All right, but uh, enough about me. Let's jump into our presentation. So that was a bit about myself. Uh, I'm also going to introduce the Forest Preserves of Cook County and Friends of the Forest Preserve. I'm going to talk about what everybody wants to hear about, what to do in Palos. Um, I'm also going to talk about the restoration that's been going on in the Palos Preserves. I'll, I'll present a short video from volunteers that have been caring for the Palos Preserves. Um, after that, we'll do a research, resource share and a quick Q&A. Um, and yeah, so let's, let's get going. So the Forest Preserve District of Cook County, it's, a, it's um, pretty unique. Uh, it's the first government of its kind in the nation. It's also, that makes it the oldest uh, government of its kind in the nation. It's also the largest forest preserve district in the nation. Um, it came about in 1914, right? About the same time as the national park system. Um, so some forward thinkers in the United States at that time uh, recognized that if people didn't start protecting land in the United States, um, for, uh, for the public and for nature, it would disappear. Um, and so because of those forward thinking people, we have the forest preserves. Um, so people like Dwight Perkins and Jens Jensen um, recognized that um, Chicago would be a booming metropolis in a hundred years. Um, and this picture of the 1800s, you can see a lot of green and pink um, and then a dark green that all represents different natural areas and ecosystems. And the red in that is, uh, you know, the urbanized areas of Chicago. Um, fast forward to 2015, and it's all red. Um, it, we, we live in a highly urbanized environment um, with little pockets of green. And those pockets of green, sometimes called the Emerald Necklace, uh, they surround the forest preserves, and those are all forest preserve, or, or they, they surround the city, and those are all forest preserve properties. Um, so without, without that forward, without those forward thinking people, we would, we would really not have any nature left in Chicago. 
Um, and that that's what the Forest Preserve's mission is all about. And one thing I want to say up front is that the Forest Preserve District of Cook County is not a park district. Um, the park district uh, really focuses on built environments that are for people uh, to enjoy, but um, this, this uh, government is dedicated to connecting people to uh, public open space, space that is protected for nature. So it's, it's very different than a park district. But that's not to say that the Forest Preserve doesn't connect with people. Um, they have a lot of amenities that the park, district, park districts would have, like golf courses and aquatic centers. Um, they, they even host, they host about a 62, 62 million visitors each year. So a lot of people come to the Forest Preserves. Um, and, you know, they, they also have the Brookfield Zoo on their property and the Chicago Botanic Garden. So there's lots of places that are for people and built for people, but the majority of their land is held um, as a public open space for natural wonders, as they describe it. Okay. And um, a lot of people say, well, Zach, you, you still work for the forest preserves? No, I don't work for the forest preserves. I work for a nonprofit called Friends of the Forest Preserves. We are independent, um, but we do try to help the forest preserves with their mission. And we're dedicated to uniting people to protect, promote, and care for the forest preserves. We started about 20 years ago as an advocacy organization, and we still are an advocacy organization to our core. Um, so that means we'll jump um, if there's, an issue like um, a road encroaching on a forest preserve or um, some some folks have approached the forest preserve district and want to buy some of the property. We'll try to shut that type of activity down because we want to preserve for nature. Um, but nowadays, uh, the forest preserves are really well run and we are trying to help them with a lot of their goals. So um, 70,000 acres is a lot of land and you need a lot of people to care for that space. Um, so this picture highlights some of the people that are caring for the space. Um, these people in the orange and gray shirts here, these are members of our conservation corps. So they're, they're paid professionals, um, but they're working hand in hand with volunteers who are out there caring for these spaces. And that's, that's kind of um, what we like to see. We wanna help um, lift up the, the paid professionals. We know there can't be enough of those folks. Um, so we need volunteers to come out and help take care of nature too. All right, so uh, the preserve system, 70,000 acres. It's, it's mostly assembled along creeks and rivers throughout the county. So you can see up here, this is the Chicago River, North Branch. Um, this is the Des Plaines, connecting to Salt Creek. We have um, Spring Creek and Poplar Creek over here, Calumet River, Plum Creek, um, Tinley Creek's down there, um, Midlothian Creek. Um, Today, today, we're gonna to talk about this area outlined in yellow, this green blob in here, that's Palis. Um, and it's a, it's a really cool space. Now there's some debate, the locals call, some people call it Palis and some people call it Palos. I'm not sure how to say it. Um, I'm gonna move forward with uh, Palos, but I'll probably go between the two. Um, it's 15,000 acres of property. It's about the size of the Indiana Dunes. It's really cool. Um, it, it's made up of oak woodlands, oak savannas. You can see all the wetlands, um, lakes, and sloughs that, that are part of that um, outlined in blue there. Um, a, a really big space. Um, and part of what makes it important for the Forest Preserve District is that because it's so large geographically um, and uh, because it's such high quality and also um, has high connectivity. So there's a lot of this property that is contiguous. Um, they've prioritized this in, in terms of ecological restoration. So this is the top priority landscape for restoration in all of Cook County. Uh, before I jump into uh, the ecological restoration aspect of it, I got to talk about the rec rec recreation aspect of Palos. It is epic. It is awesome. Um, you have big nature, you go into these forest preserves, some of them, you can be almost a mile from a road um, and you forget that you're in a major met metropolis except for some of the airplanes that occasionally fly by. Um, tons of unpaid tra unpaved trail for hiking and bird watching, lots of water. Um, there's actual topography, hills and moraines 
are uh, all over the Palos region. They have two amazing nature centers, one with a, a very unique ecosystem, a Dolomite Canyon. Um, they have a boating center at Maple Lake and across the street of, from the boating center, they have a campground. Um, several Illinois nature preserves, I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, they have some really great paved trails, including the new CalSAG Trail, um, pre the premier mountain biking in the Midwest, and then what a lot of people are drawn to first when they come to Palos is the Swallow Cliff Stairs. Yeah, so, um, I, you know, I, you can't put a map um, in a PowerPoint slide of all of Palos. It's really hard, um, but I wanted to at least try um, so you can see some of the, the, the spaces that you can explore in the Palos region. So um, up here you have a couple of the paved trails that I mentioned, the Centennial Trail, uh, i and Canal Trail, here's the Cal Sag down here. You can see you got a boat launch here. This is the boating center over here, campground here at Bull Frog Lake, um, a mountain bike staging area, on and on. Fishing ponds, Joe's Pond, um, Tuma Lake, great fishing spots. Um, there's something, there's literally something for everybody, and you're not going to run out of opportunities. Um, and a lot of these places are really special ecosystems. You can see um, these designations here. It's a little cardinal and a triangle. See that? That designates it as an Illinois Nature Preserve. So that's an extra layer of protection issued by the state of Illinois that says these will be pr protected not only by the Forest Preserve District of Cook County, but also by the Illinois Nature Preserves Commission. Um, and, and that's because those are high quality ecosystems or they're very unique ecosystems not found in many other places. Um, and, you know, I, I'm supposed to introduce one hike on this trip. If you guys are just going to visit uh, one time and you only have an hour, I would really recommend um, coming out to Cranberry Slough. Um, you can, it's, it's really easily accessible. So this is Route 45 here. Um, and sorry, right, Route 45 right here. Um, you can jump off I-55 if you're coming from the city, um, come down here, punk, park at Country Lane Woods, and you can kind of meander around this yellow trail here, and you'll enter the nature preserve, um, past Cranberry Slough, the namesake slough, um, go through some rolling hills, and up this little road, this, uh, it's an unpaved road, but it's an old, old road, um, back to your car. And you can do that in about an hour. Um, and you'll have an opportunity to see Cranberry Slough, which happens to be um, the highest priority restoration unit um, in all of the forest preserve land holdings across Cook County. So a really important place, a place that's gotten a lot of investment over the last 10 years um, by, by the Forest Preserve District, and before that, a lot of investment by local volunteers. Um, and and it, it has been absolutely transformed by ecological restoration. So. A big success story there. All right, so this is this is that hike at Country Lane Woods. Um, you can see on the left hand side, this is a little bit healthier nature. Um, you don't see what you see on the right hand side. That dense honeysuckle. Oops, that dense honeysuckle. Um, really crowded tree canopy. So workers have come in. They've thinned the tree canopy out. Um, they've thinned and removed all the invasive brush. And now you're starting to see things like uh, grasses and flowers come back in this ground layer. And that's called restoring the structure of, of the ecosystem. And the, that ground layer is really important for insects and birds. You can see here, it hasn't all come back yet, but it will. So how did we get there? Well, a lot of farming and grazing happened in the Palos area um, when, when the European settlers came. Uh, they, they, they really changed and impacted the land. Um, wood harvest, um, they, they also harvested a lot of wood, especially um, after the, the Chicago fire, um, but, but throughout the uh, 1800s and the 1900s as well. That, um, and then fire suppression um, and Smokey the Bear, who did a great job with only you can prevent forest fires, um, Turns out he did too good of a job and uh, fire suppression became a big problem because a lot of these ecosystems are fire evolved and, and need fire to function. That fire suppression um, coupled with the introduction of exotic invasive species 
um, allowed for a really rapid uh, degradation in the health of these preserves. Um, and, and so that's where uh, volunteers started coming in in the uh, 1970s and 1980s to, to start caring for the, these spaces and removing the invasives. Okay, so I was talking earlier about the prioritization of landscaping, uh, of, um, sorry, of, uh, prioritization of landscape units and restoration. Um, so the forest preserve investments in the um, in the forest preserves and how to identify areas um, that can um, uh, that can really benefit and rapidly benefit from investment in restoration. And so this is the Palos region. Um, like I said before, it's the highest priority landscape unit of, of 15 units um, across the forest preserve district land holding. The area in red here is that number one unit, it's the highest priority, um, but th th these are the top four units. Um, and then this area one and two is that Cranberry Slough project that I was describing to you. Um, and then popped out here is just um, to show how they break down their restoration unit. So um, they recognize that a landscape unit is a little bit too big to manage, they need to break it down to subunits and then also restoration units. And these are also often broken up by um, natural uh, ecosystem divisions. Okay, um, so some strategies for remnants. Um, so restoring these ecosystems is part of a, not only a geographical strategy, but um, a best management practice strategy. They, uh, they develop these uh, seven uh, factors in uh, a successful restoration project. One, remove the invasive species. And that's where we're kind of um, at in a lot of our projects. Um, some of the restoration across the county is further along than that, uh, but a lot of these uh, places are still in section one, invasive control. Um, then you get to the structural restoration, you're getting those grasses and flowers back into the preserves. Um, in some cases, you would do a, some hydrology repair. Um, you try to make connections to different ecosystems when you can. Um, and for, for the most part, we're not doing a lot of planting um, or seeding in these places, except for seeds that we collect from the preserves, uh, local preserves. We're really relying on the seed bank to respond. And a lot of that uh, is possible because these seeds stay viable for a long time. Um, but the Forest Preserve also recognizes that we need to scale the work up and get some of this done fast because they don't stay viable in perpetuity. They, these seeds will expire and then um, they won't be able to express itself when you do invasive control. So you gotta, we got to kind of work fast. Um, and then number six, return of fire, that's super important. That would, could be layered across um, and be called 1A, 2A, um, 5A, and 7A. Like, um, fire should be incorporated and is necessary for any successful restoration. All right, so these are some of the, the, the plants that we're trying to save, um, some of that, that structure that is really important for insects, um, and, and some of the plants that are starting to express themselves once you cut away that brush. Things like fire pink and uh, Michigan lily and Dutchman's breeches, a lot of really cool, cool plants um, in the Palos region. But this is a big job. I mean, 15,000 acres um, are, are not going to clear themselves of invasive brush. You're going to need a, a multi-partner approach that incorporates volunteers, uh, professional contractors, and conservation court work to get things done. Um, and this picture on the left doesn't turn into this picture on the right without uh, lots of effort. So here's some of the people that are moving the dial for us. We have volunteers and conservation corps members. Um, so here's one of our uh, Palos Conservation Corps crews. This is an older picture. Some of the, the individuals have changed, but the, the equipment has not. They still are wielding chainsaws and brush cutters and um, completing brush, fire, brush fires to get rid of the invasive brush. 
Um, we have contractors coming in. They are doing the real heavy, heavy lifting. They have access to machinery. Um, you can see this image here on the bottom right next to that brush mower. This is a map outline of Cranberry Slough. And, and the investment from the Forest Preserve since 2013 has allowed um, this almost this entire preserve to be cleared of invasive brush, which is a big, big deal. Um, that, that's great work. All right, so here's the ta-da moment. Um, this, this, the brush is moved away and then you have open canopy and a lot more sunlight reaching the forest floor. On the left hand side, you can see the nasty invasive species like barberry and buckthorn, honeysuckle, choking out the healthy uh, natural ecosystem. And on the right, after volunteers and contractors and conservation corps have come in and help maintain these spaces, it's a lot more open. Although, Admittedly, there still needs to be some trees removed. Okay, um, and you know, the last thing I'll say before we jump into our video here is that um, it's really important to track your progress and the forest preserves have done a nice job with that as well. You can see from 2015 to 2018, these are some of the projects they've worked on in Palos after they prioritized Palos as a um, restoration landscape unit. Um, and then also we have a lot more areas that are under restoration and this slide's a little bit old so you're going to see in the next five years more chunks of invasive species being removed from this space um, and that's really exciting to me. All right I'm going to switch over to quick video. Hi my name is Sochi Lopez and I'm Palos crew manager at Friends of the Forest. Hi, my name is Sochi Lopez and I'm Palos Crew Manager at Friends of the Forest Reserve. Our conservation crews are dedicated to removing invasive plants that threaten the health of the forest reserves. But today is a special day and we're going to be doing something a little different. I'll be interviewing some longtime volunteer stewards and they might be showing us around to some of their favorite spots. Oh. I have a lot of favorite places here in the forest preserves and they're north, they're south, they're all over, but here in the southwest, almost um, any place you go, it's just wonderful. Right now we're at Sagawa um, Environmental Learning Center and um, we're on a mowed grass trail. There's two and a half miles. Okay, sorry about that. Let me, let me try this again. They're north, they're south, they're all over, but here in the southwest, almost um, any place you go, it's just wonderful. Right now we're at Sagawa um, Environmental Learning Center, and um, we're on a mowed grass trail. There's two and a half miles of trail loops here, so you could do a trail, and then you could sit down, and then do another trail and sit down. I especially like to recommend that people go on trails, because then they can see a wider area, they can see different habitat, and they can kind of experience being in the landscape just by staying on the trail. And also, it's much better for the habitat because we're healing up a lot of these areas with the restoration work that we're doing. And so we really like it when people stay on the trail so that the land can heal up. So we got the best preserves in the county. We have 
so much variety, so much uh, diversity of land out here. It's just mind-blowing. My favorite spot in Palos, I like to tell people, is where, wherever I'm standing at the moment. Um, but truthfully, Swallow Cliff is one. Um, I go on the stairs for exercise. I cross-country ski the Loop Trail in the South Woods, and we volunteer here as well. Okay, if you're coming to visit the Palos Preserves, it would depend on what you want to see. Uh, if you're a birder, I would say McClowry Springs for sure. But I've also heard uh, a lot of good sightings at Spears Woods, um, here at Swallow Cliff, at uh, Cap Sowers Holding, a lot of different places. If you like uh, fantastic topography, Cap Sowers, Willow Springs, Willow West, great ravines and bluffs. Um, that's a lot of the attraction of Palos, that it's not flat like a lot of the rest of Illinois. Spring wildflowers, um, definitely black partridge woods, Powery Springs, Paddock Woods are great, Swallow Cliff as well. Um, well, I have uh, literally hundreds of favorite spots, especially because the seasons change, you know, at any given time, one spot or another spot. Uh, but yeah, this is a, a really great spot. We're out in the middle of Spears Woods, and that's Hogwash Slough, uh, which I always like the name. It's like, where did these things get their names from? And well, some forest preserve gave, the person gave it to them. But anyway, you say, Hogwash, you think, oh, the, the pigs were here. Some, this is some clue to the Hogwash. Nonsense. I always thought that was a funny name. Anyway, it's a very nice pond, one way or the other, name or not. And it's really interesting and cool. We've worked a lot on these woods, and I see, you know, all the you know, birds, like there's a, a red-headed woodpecker flying around. And uh, uh, it's just a, it's a great spot. There's something for everybody here, as they say, a lot of wildflowers, a lot of birds. So this is American bellflower right here. And over here we have Joe pie weed and we have hog peanuts. So this area's got a lot of diversity. And even down by the um, ground level, we have some different sedges. And we're gonna have a bunch of asters that will bloom a little bit later in the year. This one here is gonna be real pretty with blue flowers. This is tall blue lettuce right here. Uh, lettuce fl Floridiana, I think is the name of it. Um, but you can see there's a lot of beautiful diversity here, and so it's really fun to come here and see how the scenery changes from season to season. This whole area was um, encroached in really deeply with uh, um, honeysuckle. Honeysuckle is a plant that um, people put into their yards. And a lot of times people think of the plants that they put in their yard from a human perspective, like, what do I like? And I think now it's kind of nice that people are starting to think about putting things in that the insects and the birds are gonna like because we need them, we're all part of this planet. The honeysuckle um, got very thick and we had to bring the volunteers in to help cut it out. And it hasn't just been the volunteers, we've had a lot of help. We have help from the Friends of the Forest, we have help from the Shedd Aquarium, we have help from um, Friends of the Chicago River. Uh, right now we're fortunate enough to have a grant from the Illinois Clean Energy Foundation. We've got a grant here in McClowry Springs, and we also have a grant at Willow Springs, and these are going to be helping us bring out more people to get the work done. And also, they've helped us get um, Conservation Corps out to do a lot of great work um, on the ground. This side got fire when the prairie was set on fire, but this side didn't, so this side got much more brushy. And this side is almost all oaks. This side used to have in a lot of cherry and other things. We need to thin trees to get it into better shape, really. It's all about getting a little more light in the woods. Let's see what the prairie looks like. When you get a, a, a burn, a landscape fire that the Forest Preserve does, you can often get a lot more flowers even. Here's some uh, Baptisia. This is a nice native plant. Those are the pods. Here's some uh, early goldenrod. Hasn't quite flowered yet. Just starting. The goldenrods tend to be later in the season. And they're all yellow, as their name indicates. Well, we have some thimbleweed here. 
Oh, here's an old one. This is interesting. I guess it's an old, that's one from last year, but this is the head left over. Uh, you can kind of see why it's called thimble wheat, and here's the seed left over still on the stem, an old stem from last year. It's kind of a cottony, uh, fluffy uh, thing, and we can kind of scatter that. Oh, here's some, uh, they haven't flowered. <laughs> well, here's our big blue stem. Uh, that's a, a, a native grass. But here's our uh, prairie dock, it's called, with the big fan-shaped leaves that are cool because the roots run so far down. Now, this is going to flower like a sunflower. It hasn't quite come out yet. I want to talk a little bit about the volunteer work that we've been doing here at Swallow Cliff South. The preserve itself has been under management since the 1990s by uh, Forest Preserve staff and contractors. But in end of February or March 2017, started right at the top of uh, the hill here along the trail, clearing brush. Right after that, uh, burn crew came in and burned a little section up there. And by sometime in April, we had blood root popping up where there had been none just uh, weeks earlier. Our, our steward, Jackie Maidoff, says this place is like a treasure chest. Just let, let the sunlight in and it'll do the rest of the work for you. And that's what we're finding. Right now, the best way to volunteer is to contact us and get put on an invitation list. So if you uh, go to restorepalos.com, that's our website, or uh, restorepalos at gmail.com. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks for your patience on getting that video going. I'm going to jump back into my slides here, pick up where I left off. All right, so I just wanted to share some additional resources. Um, Peter is going to drop this into the chat function so you can copy it and paste it onto, onto your computer um, and explore some of these places. Um, the Forest Preserves of Cook County. Um, has a great website. They have, um, you can access volunteer opportunities there, but you can also access the, the Palos Trail System map that I pulled up earlier in the presentation. Really cool, uh, um, really cool map. That's our website, fotfp.org. Um, Hike It Baby Chicago, so th this is a national organization that helps connect young people to nature. Um, and, and I really recommend um, following them on Facebook if you wanted to go hike and explore um, with a group. Uh, the, P the Palos Restoration Project, restorepalos.com, uh, if you wanted to get your name on a mailing list and you're interested in coming out and volunteering. Um, and the Chicago Area Mountain Bikers, uh, camber.org. Uh, they're, great, they're great stewards of, of the trails that, that they bike in Palos and they have um, lots of really cool events and they are great guides if you're just getting into mountain biking. Um, Friends of the Forest Preserve has a great social media presence. I hope that you follow us um, on all the different formats, Facebook, LinkedIn. We have a, a, a rapidly developing YouTube channel. So um, if you wanted to see some other videos or, or training opportunities, you can tune in there over the next year. Um, and, and thank you. Let's we can, uh, jump into Q&A now. Awesome. Thank you so much, Zach. And for a reminder for anyone who has more questions as they come up, you can put them into the Q&A box um, at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to some of the ones that were in the comments as well, but sometimes they get lost. Um, so we'll start with a few of the questions here in the Q&A box. Zach, we'll start with one. Uh, what exactly constitutes a slow or a slaw and what does the word actually mean? Sure. Um, thanks. So I, it's pronounced slew, actually, despite that funky spelling. Um, and it's really just a shallow lake or pond. Um, I think it's, it's because it's so shallow and, and um, smaller um, that, that, that they get a, a special designation. A lot of the sloughs found in Palos are left over from um, either glacial melt, melt or some of them um, are, are connected to the groundwater table.
Awesome. We've got another question. Um, how hard is it to keep invasive species uh, out from or from coming back once they have been removed? Pretty hard. Um, you know, the, the initial investment up front is, is um, quite large, but it, a lot of this work requires ongoing maintenance. That's part of why these, these volunteers are, are so important. Um, and it's also part of why our conservation corps exists. So, you, you know, you have a, um, a big investment up front, but maintenance is required. Um, although it's not nearly as much as that initial investment. Um, and the other big part of it is getting prescribed fire into these systems. Once prescribed fire is back in, um, it's a lot easier to control some of the, some of the invasives. Excellent. Here's a couple questions that all kind of fit in the same category. Um, and people are curious about once you remove certain invasive species, if the oak trees, if they're reseeding, if they're coming back, um, or if they're, we're getting some of that canopy back in the areas that we're working or restoring. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so these young oaks, they need both, um, in some cases they need fire, um, and, and they all need sunlight and space. And um, when the, the thing with the buckthorn and the honeysuckle is they leaf out earlier in the spring than oaks leaf out, um, and they, they maintain their leaves for a very long time. So it's hard for um, young saplings to get the sunlight they need to emerge from the soil. Um, that's why it's important to um, remove them. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of these oaks are still uh, regenerating, so uh, an important step. Awesome. Here's a question about uh, recreation in the Palos area. Um, someone asked that it looked like a lot of the trails on the map were made of gravel. Um, are there gravel trails? And, and I know it's a big thing for, for runners or for bikers. Um, how could you find gravel trails in the Palos area or where should you look? Yeah, most of the trails um, in that map are designated as limestone trails. The dotted, the dotted spaces um, and the dashed lines, those are limestone trails. So good for running. Um, I see a lot of um, kind of like fat tire bikes um, in those spaces. Um, so yeah, they're, they're, they're gravel for the most part. They do have uh, some single track, which is, um, is either um, like grass mode or just a compacted soil trail. Going back to some of your first slides, someone asked um, if you could explain the difference between the Cook County Forest Preserves Friends or the Friends of the, for the, Friends of the Forest Preserves and the Foundation, the Cook County Forest Preserve Foundation. Sure. Uh, so Forest Preserve District of Cook County is a government um, and uh, it is run by the same commissioners that run the Cook County government, um, but it's a separate governing body. So that can be kind of confusing, um, but both of them have the same president. That's Tony Preckwinkle. Um, then there's Friends of the Forest Preserves. We are an independent nonprofit um, and we are focused on advocacy, engagement and conservation. Um, and then you have the Forest Preserve Foundation which is um, essentially a foundation that works to fund a lot of the work that we're discussing um, in this presentation. So they fund a couple of our high school programs. Um, they, they, fund, um, they have funded our adult crews at times um, and they fund a lot of the conservation work that I discussed today. Uh, here's a question that I think we've gotten at most of our webinars. Um, it's a question about ticks in the forest preserves. So if there are ticks in the preserves and maybe what are some simple things you can do to uh, be aware of them or to avoid them when you're out walking in the preserves? Yeah, so there for sure are ticks. Um, anytime you're walking in like tall grasses, um, then you're um, especially susceptible. Um, so one thing you can do and when what Diana was saying in the video is just stay on the trail. Um, it's, it's a lot harder for the, the ticks to grab onto your clothes that way. Um, I often, I know this is going to sound pretty nerdy, but I tuck my pants into my socks. Um, and I don't look cool, but I don't have ticks on me at the end of the day. So you can do that. And then you can, you know, if you have a, um, a little bug spray, you can, you can spray your, your socks if you know, okay, I'm going to be going into some, some of the grasses on, on a tighter trail, like a single track. And we did have a follow up to that question. Um, They're wondering specifically about deer ticks, if they are present in the preserves and if anything changes for deer versus dog ticks. 
Yeah, I mean, the, there are both types of, uh, there are several different types of ticks present in the forest. You, know, you, gotta, you have to look out for all, all the different types of ticks and um, you have to be careful. Uh, here's a question about how do the forest preserves and friends work with uh, the community around the Palos region to increase habitat on um, uh, increase habitat outside the forest preserves or non forest preserve district land. Um, so, uh, uh, Peter, can you repeat that? Is that a conservation at home question? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. It's talking about or like um, habitat outside the forest preserves or what sort of species you might have in your backyard that could support the work or the, the ecosystems that are in the forest preserves. Sure. I, I think I probably would point you to um, some different resources to do additional research um, in terms of what would be good for your yard. Um, I know a lot of park districts are also incorporating some natural areas, um, uh, bioswales and um, greenscaping is, is becoming very popular right now. Um, but I suggest going to um, a website um, called Possibility Place. It's an, uh, a, a nursery out in Moni. Um, they have all sorts of different native um, plants and trees and shrubs, and their website is really is really good at describing um, what each um, species might be good for. Um, also, Illinois Wildflowers is a free website that just discusses um, all of the different wildflowers that you can find in Illinois, and then also does um, for a, a, a faunal associations with those wildflowers. So you can see, oh yeah, I want this type of bee or that type of bee or this type of bee or butterfly might like that plant. Next, we have a question from Soshi. What is your favorite habitat and why? Wow. Um, Putting you on the spot. Question. Um, I guess, I, I gotta say oak savanna is probably my favorite uh, habitat. Um, you, you get kind of a little bit of the best of both worlds. You get some of the same species you might see in a prairie. Um, but you get these uh, magical um, baroques that uh, just are really, really cool and, um, you know, remind you of your place in the world. They're, they're so big. Uh, we've got a few questions here. Uh, here's one from Ruta about uh, the best areas for cross-country skiing. And a few folks have asked about cross-country skiing, um, maybe a good place to start with wide trails, some hills, but not too advanced. Sure. Um, so uh, Camp Sagawa, the Sagawa Environmental Learning Center is a place I'd point to you, you to first, um, partly because if you're just getting in, they rent cross-country skis there. Um, and they have the, that two, those two, two and a half mile loops. So you can do one loop, relax, take a break and do another loop that's a little bit more challenging. Um, and then I've, I've gone in a lot of the other preserves as well that, um, you know, they have those limestone trails, but um, the snowpack is really good, um, just to the right or left of those trails, and um, you can you can ski all over these these preserves. Um, I, you know, I'll just do a quick plug for my ski club, Don't Cross Me Ski Club. Um, you can find us on Facebook. Um, it's a really good time to pick up cross country skiing. Awesome. <laughs> And I've, there's getting lots of really great questions in the Q&A, so I know already I won't be able to answer them all, but thanks so much, everybody, for submitting these. We're going to get through as many as we can, but any that we don't, too, we'll follow up on email. Um, Barbara's asking about uh, some of the different sites where volunteers work, on, work in Palos. Um, how often are the work days, and where can you find more information about that? Um, yeah, so they have they have uh, weekly work days with COVID-19. A lot of that work was suspended, but um, from what I'm hearing that um, some work days are getting together again. Um, visit restorepalos.com. Um, you can get on their email list. You can find up um, up to date information there. You can go also to the Forest Preserve District's website and you can see a calendar of all the, um, the different volunteer opportunities. Great question, thank you. We, we need people to take care of nature. We've got time for just another couple questions here, but here's a trivial one just in case to throw you off. How, uh, Pat is wondering how many steps are there at the Swallow Cliff Stairs? <laughs> I believe there are 128. Um, that's, uh, and it's a, it's a pretty steep incline. It, it, you know, if, you're, if you haven't been out there before, um, very popular place to exercise. Great way to get your heart rate up. They have um, a little bit more amenities now, a nice bathroom, 
Um, and then there's great access to nature right behind it. Um, and then just awesome views of the, the, the whole valley in front of it. Um, I would recommend sticking to like maybe three to five sets of stairs before doing any more. You won't be able to walk after that. Probably would just be one for me. <laughs> uh, Barbara is wondering, what is the best place in the Palos Preserves uh, for photographers in the fall? So I, I'm guessing about kind of fall foliage, taking pictures of trees. Yeah, um, there's, I mean, Palos is not lacking in trees, but my, one of my favorite spots for vistas is Saganashki Slough. Um, it, you can combine some shots with um, both the, the tree canopy, but also that open water, um, really, really great spot to capture a sunset. I would recommend starting there. Oh, we even got an answer from Jan in the, oh, in thanks, the Jan. chat box too. <laughs> um, Jan, another Jan in the audience asked about if there are any uh, big open prairies in the Palos area, if you're going to Palos but want to visit a prairie site, do you have any recommendations for that? Um, yeah, there are a couple. Um, there's a couple big open prairies. Um, we'll have to get a, a map link to you all, but Cherry Hill is one that you can go see. It's a, it's a, um, a restored prairie section. Um, and there's another really nice prairie, a couple of really nice prairies at Beers Woods that you can hike into. You kind of have to pass some oak woodlands, um, but then you get a few nice prairies there. And um, at Cap Sowers Holdings, there's a, there's a place called Visitation Prairie. That's a very cool space. Um, and it, um, it's, it's a little bit deeper in, but it's sure worth the payoff of, of the hike because it's a big open prairie. Awesome. And our last question for now, and it's a couple parter, we've got a, quite a few questions about Cranberry Slough. Um, they're wondering, uh, Ginger is wondering when restoration started in that area. Uh, another question is if there are cranberries in the Cranberry Slough, um, if, if you give both of those. Sure. Um, so, you know, restoration uh, um, from the Forest Preserve District of Cook County um, as part of their next century conservation plan and the natural resources and cultural, cultural master plan started in 2013. Um, so some of those slides I was showing, all that invasive brush got um, removed from 2013 to about 20, well, now 2020. Um, but volunteers, I know, I know people like Joan Newman um, and Diana Krug have been out uh, volunteering in Cranberry Slough for a lot longer than that. Um, and are there cranberries in Cranberry Slough? No, not anymore. Uh, there are not uh, cranberries in Cranberry Slough. Um, and, but I, I, I've heard that there, there was at one point. Um, there's, a little, there's a little island in the slough itself um, that has a lot of um, button bush and other uh, native species growing on it. And I heard that cranberries had been growing amongst them. Awesome. <laughs> well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have tonight for questions. Uh, there are a lot of really great ones in the Q&A box. So if, you, if your question wasn't addressed live during our webinar, we're going to go back and reach out to you directly um, and provide more information and links. And then Zach will also kind of send another uh, email around to everybody who's been registered with some more information about how to find, find more about Palos and, and get out there and explore. So just once again, thanks, thank you everybody so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate everyone taking the time out of your evening to join us. Um, it's you know, not the same as a walk in the preserves, but it feels like it is with so many friendly faces in the audience and, and learning about this special region. So we hope to see you out in the field again soon. In the meantime, we'll keep in touch via email, social media, and you can always find more information on our website, friendsoftheforestpreserve.org. Uh, Friends is a membership-based organization. So after tonight's webinar, if you feel in inspired to join us as a member or make any donation to support our work, uh, Gloria will put the link into the chat box on Friends of the For Forest Preserve's website. But just everybody, thanks again for joining and thank you so much, Zach, for presenting. And we'll see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night.